we have gone through just a couple of weeks of such market volatility. Uh, it's days before the big conference in Jackson Hole. I want to go back to the last meeting, July 31st. You dissented. Mm -hmm. You cited low unemployment um, and your questions about financial stability, some concerns. Your colleagues were looking at muted inflation and these global developments, as they call them, that could basically hurt the U.S. economy. Explain your dissent to us. So you did a pretty good job, actually, <laughs> of laying out the dissent. It was tied to the fact that economic conditions are still pretty good. So 3.7 percent unemployment is still a very low rate. Uh, inflation is a little bit low. So if you look at the core measure, it's 1.6 percent. But if you take out some of the outliers using uh, Dallas trim mean, then it's closer to 2 percent. In fact, it's exactly 2 percent. So my own view was that we have to be careful not to ease too much when we don't have significant problems. And so the focus is not to do something that affects the exchange rate or something that necessarily takes care of the world economy. We're supposed to focus on unemployment and inflation in the United States. And so I think we're in a pretty good spot right now. And there are costs to easing at times that you don't need to ease. What's the cost? There's several costs. Uh, one is one of the ways that monetary policy works is that you cause people to buy houses and cars earlier than they otherwise would, intertemporal substitution. You choose to make an investment now because interest rates you think are going to be temporarily low, and so you make expenditures you might not otherwise make. A second is that when we lower interest rates, we make the cost of debt lower. That means that both households and firms are more likely to be leveraged. And if they get leveraged right before we have more significant problems, they're actually in much worse shape. So we have to think about the financial stability characteristics, and by that, it's thinking of how much do we want households and firms to be leveraged going into whenever we actually do have a significant downturn. How concerned are you about a significant downturn? The signs from the global economy, the signs from the uh, bond market in particular, even signs from Wall Street banks that have cut their GDP forecasts, and, and recession indicators suggest the recession risk is rising. Is it rising in your eyes? So many of those indicators are tied to financial markets. So let's start with what most economists think is the likely outcome. One way to gauge that is to look at something like the blue chip forecast. So we just came off real GDP being at 2.1 percent. Uh, the blue chip forecast for August had uh, growth for the third quarter and fourth quarter, both at exactly 2 percent roughly exactly the same as the second quarter. That's clearly not a recession. It's continued growth at a moderate pace. They also have unemployment rate at exactly basically where we are right now. It's actually a tenth less in the blue chip forecast. So economic forecasters aren't seeing a lot of weakness in the data. What I think has people really focused on whether we're going to have a recession is the combination of volatility and stock market. We obviously had a very big movement uh, a week ago when we lost 800 points on the Dow. But in subsequent days, we've moved back up. And if you look at the long bond, it is very low. So it's around 1.6 percent. Uh, one of the reasons for that is the global weakness. But the cure for global weakness is for countries around the world to expand either with fiscal or monetary policy in their own countries rather than just the United States to be doing the easing. The concern now is uncertainties created by this ongoing trade war. August 1st, one day after the Fed cut the key rate, Donald Trump said, hey, I'm possibly, or I'm, I'm threatening right now to put 10 percent tariffs, additional 10 percent tariffs on China's exports to the United States on September 1st. That's when we saw the stock market to start to fall and get volatile. China's currency, they let it weaken past seven to the dollar. That was another very important signal. There are I think people are trying to be forward-looking, unlike the blue chip indicators, which I think there's, people feel like there is something afoot right now that the United States cannot be immune from. And I think that's the concern and why the, the majority on the uh, FOMC went for an insurance rate cut. Mm -hmm. So how do you get 2 percent growth given the weakness in business fixed investment and net exports? And the answer is consumption. So if consumption grows at 3 percent, and consumption 70 percent of GDP, then you're going to grow at 2 percent even if everything else is at zero. And so in the second quarter, that's pretty much what we found. Consumption was very strong. All the other components of GDP were quite weak. 
And when you look at the composition, so I'd argue that the forecasters are actually trying to look forward as well. And they think that the economy will grow at 2%. They're taking into account that business fixed investment will be weak. They're taking into account that they think net exports will be weak. But nonetheless, they think that it's going to average out to 2%, in part because they think the consumer will continue to buy. Now, that's a question. If the stock market becomes too volatile, if people become too concerned about global pressures, about uh, trade, about geopolitical concerns, then the consumer may not be as strong over the next couple of quarters, and that is a risk. So I think this is a good time to actually sit back, look very closely at the data, ask if the consumer is going to continue uh, to be consuming the way they have over the last couple of quarters. And if that's so, then I'm not nearly as worried about recession risk. If that doesn't occur, then there won't be anything offsetting the weakness that's occurring in business fixed investment and net exports as a result of the trade concerns and the global concerns. So then as you look ahead to the September meeting, you're a voting member, and uh, the question of cutting rates again, I think that's what people, will, the question will be on the table. Um, are you watching the consumer very closely then as something that would tilt you not toward waiting to see, but saying, no, I, I agree, I'm on board, it's time to cut rates and cut them again? So I'm watching a number of things. I'm certainly looking at what the consumer's doing. So consumer confidence was a little weaker. That's something I'm paying attention to. But the retail sales number was actually quite strong. That would indicate that if that continues, we're going to have enough consumption in the third quarter that it's actually going to bolster GDP. I'm certainly going to pay attention to geopolitical concerns. So Brexit is coming up in October. There are clearly problems in Hong Kong that could spill over in a broader sense into international markets. Hong Kong's one of the great global cities, uh, so we do have to be concerned about how that all gets resolved. So there are plenty of things to be worried about. I think that we can't really be determining monetary policy too far in advance. Even the tariffs, they've been announced, but we're not certain that they're actually going to go into effect on September 1st. They've already staggered some of the imposition of the tariffs, and so I think we just need to see what actually is going to happen and how the economy reacts. Let's look at market signals, because uh, people talk about, you know, bond again right now, bond market Armageddon, 30-year um, bond below 2%. It's back above 2%. Nevertheless, first time ever since they started issuing treasuries regularly in 1977, twos to tens, very important yield curve indicator, uh, inverted for the first time since the financial crisis was just in its infancy, right? Mm -hmm. So, and these yield, yield curves are inverted, inverting around the world. Is it, is that, a, how important is the signal, is that to you? Because for many people, I think it supports this idea that you can't wait. You can't wait too long. You can't wait for the data to show things are getting worse because there's some signals right now that, that maybe it is and it's more prudent to act early rather than wait. So it's an important signal. I do pay attention to it. I do want to understand why financial markets are pricing the way they are. So at a 10-year at 1.6%, if you look at the German 10-year yield, it's uh, roughly <laughs> minus, minus 0.6. 6. <laughs> so it's a big difference between the two. So I think a lot of the reason why our long bond rate has gone down is because global conditions are weaker. Europe is weaker. Asia is weaker. Part of that's trade. Part of that's other factors. Um, if the glo it's, We're not a great exporting nation. China's a great exporting nation. Germany is a great exporting nation. Italy is a great exporting nation. Japan is. All those countries are very dependent on their exports. Now, it's not that we don't have exports, but exports are a relatively small percentage of our GDP relative to other countries. So if international trade is slowing down, they're going to be disproportionately affected relative to us. Now, if that becomes a weakness that's strong enough that it actually causes our economy to slow down, that's something I actually do want to react to. But the forecasts are trying to take all those factors into account. And I have a forecast very similar to the private forecasters that we're likely to have a second half of the year that's much closer to 2% growth when we have a low unemployment rate and relatively low inflation. Unless that changes, and it may change, uh, I don't see a lot of need to take action. Treasury yields, on the run treasuries, every single one of them now is below the Fed funds rate. Mm -hmm. Is that a signal that Fed policy is too tight? Not that the Fed got it wrong, but that the world has shifted around the Fed. And in order to get the yield curve at a more normal shape, it makes sense to, to cut the funds rate and, 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 and get that, the, 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 have that aligned more traditionally as you would expect it to be 
with a healthy economy, inflation's at not low. I mean, is is this a situation that is a bit, again, of a strong signal about where policy is and where it should go? The goal of monetary policy is not to get the yield curve right. It's to get unemployment and inflation right. And so we need to be focused on what our actual goals are, which are keeping the unemployment rate, maximum employment, and price stability. So. It is important to look at the yield curve and ask us, is it telling us that the unemployment rate's going to go up dramatically? If you thought the unemployment rate was going to go up dramatically and you thought that that was lo very likely to occur, then we should be easing. I think the question that uh, I have is whether that actually is going to happen. So there are other reasons for why the yield curve is low. We have not had a low interest rate environment globally like we do right now. Monetary policy in many countries is hampered by the fact that they have negative rates already. So they have less tools to work with. Ideally, we'd be seeing more fiscal expansion in some of those countries that would offset the weakness in their own countries. It's going to be very difficult for the United States to cause China and Europe to grow much more quickly. It's much more efficient for China and Europe to expand their own economies. Is it tougher? I mean, if we're now in a low inflation, low growth, low yield world, what does that mean for Fed policy? Does Fed policy then have to look at its metrics somewhat differently? Is it possible that we'll have low inflation, very low unemployment, and 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 again, not maybe not need to have the Fed funds rate where it is? That uh, this this ascent to what two and a half percent occurred under certain conditions, and now we're seeing an inflation rate that doesn't want to rise in spite of low unemployment. Uh, and it's not just in the U.S., it is globally. And if things are weak over there, don't we import some of that disinflation? Again, I think putting some question about how the framework is working right now. So the Fed funds rate is roughly 2.13 percent. Inflation target is 2 percent. We basically have zero real rates now. So in my view, monetary policy is already accommodative. Fiscal policy, their new fiscal agreement, is also an accommodative fiscal policy. So we already have accommodative monetary and accommodative fiscal policy. I would argue that wages are going up. They're going up gradually, but they have been going up. So if you look at average hourly earnings, if you look at the ECI, they've both been trending up. I would say that inflation, actually, if you look at something like the Dallas Trim mean, has now leveled off around 2%, which is exactly where we want to be. So I'm expecting the inflation numbers the last two CPI numbers have been reasonably strong. I'm expecting core PCE also to be converging towards 2%. That's exactly what the Dallas trim mean is designed to do. It takes out the outliers and said, what's the underlying inflation rate? And it's saying roughly 2% right now. So we need to be focused on what the goals of monetary policy are. We need to take into account the global conditions and ask whether inflation and unemployment are going to go off track because of that. And that's certainly a possibility, which is why we really have to be very focused on how bad the global conditions get. But just because other countries are weak, if we're strong, doesn't necessarily mean that we should be easing as well. You know, I, one thing I, I want to share with our, our audience that they not know about you, that you've been president of the Boston Fed uh, since 2007. You have done serious economic research and monetary research for many years, but you also have done a lot of work on financial regulation and banking. And in fact, at the Boston Fed, your last job was bank supervision. You have hands-on experience with banks, how they can become unstable. I say all this to ask you the question, is this your biggest concern about cutting rates more? Is it not so much about inflation getting too high, but you're concerned that somehow this is going to cause an excessive reach for yield or people getting, banks getting over leveraged and cause financial instability down the road? So I'm very concerned about financial stability concerns and what a low interest rate environment entails. So I do think that when you have corporations that have much more leverage, whenever the economic downturn occurs, it'll be a much more severe downturn than it otherwise would be. So companies that are highly leveraged are more likely to get into problems during a recession. They're going to have to lay off more quickly. They're going to have to make more dramatic changes in order to avoid bankruptcy. So that is one of my big concerns is the lower interest rates are, the more you're encouraging people to take on more debt. And is this the right stage of the cycle for us to encourage people to be taking on more debt? If we have an inverted yield curve, even if it's just flat, if we have a slowdown in the economy, I mean, inverted yield curve makes it, tough, makes it tough for banks to make money. A recession hurts banks as well. Isn't that also a risk 
as you look at the landscape when it comes to banks. Not that they're going to reach for too much yield, but they're not going to make enough money. And that's one of the worst things that can happen to the bank. So the worst thing to happen to a bank is getting very large loan losses. And so when I look around at the risks that banks are taking, one of my big concerns is commercial real estate. So we're in Boston, you can look out this window, you see lots of buildings, some of them are relatively new. Uh, there are new models of real estate that I think in many respects are a reaching for yield behavior. So when you look at shared office space, for example, I think that's an indication that the pricing of commercial real estate has gotten quite rich. And in the next economic downturn, we may see more losses in commercial real estate than we otherwise would. So that's an example where low interest rates can encourage firms to take on more risk with commercial real estate, which in the next economic downturn would cause problems for banks' loan losses. So usually banks don't go bankrupt because the profit margin's low. They usually go bankrupt or, or lose their capital because they have very large loan losses. You know, um, central bankers talk about, you know, minimax. Mm -hmm. You want to, what is it, minimize your biggest risk. So what's the biggest risk for the Fed right now? Is the biggest risk that you cut rates again uh, and you find out, oh, you really didn't need it, and maybe get even a little more inflation, but of course it's been below target for a long time, or is the biggest risk that you wait too long and wait to see all these signs materialize so you get the slowdown that turns into a recession, which you're trying to avoid? So that get, gets back to an earlier point about monetary policy. So the federal funds rate's already just barely above 2%. So when we do have that next recession and we want to encourage people to spend more, it's going to be at a time when they're pulling back and when firms are pulling back. There's very little risk in a recession of a reach for yield behavior. The unemployment rate is 3.7%. We're at a very different stage of the cycle right now. So I actually think it is a bigger risk to encourage people to take on too much more risk at this time. I want to ask you to clarify something about your dissent relative to the stock market because you, when you put out your list of charts, mm -hmm. you, you showed, and at the time, July 31st, stocks were still at, almost at their record highs, right? They now they're down a bit, still up for the year, et cetera, or up for, from the lows. But um, w w it, it seems like you're saying, well, stocks are a sign, everything's fine. You know, um, people are buying stocks, they're confident. The, Financial conditions are easy, but another way to look at it is what's been happening to bond yields, going back to that. The more bond yields fall, the, the more attractive stocks are by definition. And uh, in fact, I think some people are talking about the fact that the lower these yields get, and as we have $16 trillion worth of negative bond yields around the world now, of course you're going to buy stocks. And so is that one more issue that the Fed has to address when you look at the messages, the signals from the markets? So that is a financial stability concern. So when you're looking at a stock price, you're looking at what the earnings will be over time, and you're looking at the discount rate. So when we lower the rate, the discount rate becomes lower. That does cause stock prices and other asset prices to go up. If you're worried about a recession, you're not very concerned about that risk because the fact that you're going to have much lower earnings in the recession means that you actually would be expecting stock prices to go down if you thought there was a high probability of a recession. So if you look at stock prices, we're about 2% off right now relative to where we were at the last FOMC meeting. That's not a very big decline. You could have a 2% movement in a given day. So we're still pretty close to our all-time highs. Forecasters still expect we're going to get reasonable growth over the second half of the year. Yes, bond rates are low, but I think it's reflective of the global conditions, and global conditions are weak. So I'm not saying there aren't circumstances in which I would be willing to ease. I just want to see evidence that we are actually going into something that's more of a slowdown. If I'm growing at 2%, I'm not as worried about that. I want to underscore what you just said. So, because I think anyone listening will, so Eric Rosengren, uh, I'm hearing you, you sound pretty positive on the economy, it doesn't sound like you'd be for rate cuts, but you just said that if you see the economy slowing, then you would be on, in, on that side of considering a rate cut even at the September meeting. If the economy is slowing sufficiently and I'm worried about the unemployment rate going up, that would be circumstances where I would actually want to ease. During the financial crisis, I was one of the most dovish members of the committee. I was encouraging us to do both QE. I, my dissent was actually for easing, and it was at a time, my first dissent was actually at a time when we were lowering rates. I didn't think we were lowering it quickly enough. It was a very different circumstance, so I do think we have to be data dependent. 
This is a time to be very focused on the data, not to give a lot of forward guidance, but be pretty clear about what's going to cause us to change our rates. How hard is it to dissent at an FOMC meeting? It's not easy. And it's a consensus-driven organization, and it should be. And so you should only dissent if you strongly disagree with where policy is going at the time.